tonight. He was the most traveled man of his time. 201 countries. Right here in this auditorium, the most fantastic man that you've ever seen in all your life. Ripley was curious about everything. It's inexhaustible, all the weirdness in the world. I think he felt he was barely scratching the surface of it. Ripley, believe it or not, on American Experience. Exclusive corporate funding for American Experience is provided by Liberty Mutual Insurance. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. And here is that uncanny, unassailable, unmatched, unparalleled underwriter with the ultimate and unexampled, unconfutable, ultra-unbelievable, unquestionable upheavals. Believe it or not... Bob Ripley. And greetings, everybody, and welcome to the program. On the stage here, we have assembled a group of, believe it or not, people. As you can see, this gentleman, uh, he's able to blow up a balloon with his eyes. Now, if you watch closely, you can see him do it. You can see perfectly. He's absolutely normal in every other respect. Mr. Adlon, he's one of the most essential oddities of all times. He uh, doesn't use a razor, he uses a blowtorch. Now, just try this on your five o'clock shadow. Now, this is actually a torch with a temperature of almost 1,000 degrees. He has a... In 1939, Broadway raised the curtain on a new kind of showstopper a unique museum that brought the newspaper feature, believe it or not, to shocking three-dimensional life. The auditorium, as it was called, was the latest incarnation of the popular multimedia brand that for two decades had mesmerized the nation with an encyclopedic pageant of one-of-a-kind wonders, arcane trivia, and homespun Americana. Now you can just imagine somebody reading this stuff in their daily paper and their mind, their mind is blown. <laughs> the cartoon introduced Americans to a paper hanger with one arm. The fakirs of India, piano playing dogs, and a ham seller named Sam Heller. It was almost as if you were to take this enormous confetti of data and put it into a food processor and push high until it blew up and splattered all over the page. And then you wrote, believe it or not, by Ripley. The feature was the brainchild of Robert Ripley, a shy, buck-toothed sports cartoonist who traveled to the ends of the earth, collecting curiosities for his eager audiences. Human beings have an appetite for the strange for the odd, the unusual, the grotesque, the fantastic. And I think he intuitively understood that. Tonight's broadcast of a holy man from India as he actually walked barefoot over red hot coals of fire. Right. Ripley was constantly searching, searching, searching. He had a fever for finding new odd things. He loved it. One of the appeals of Ripley was that he was kind of a regular guy. He was part world traveler, part hasty, which people often called him. He was not a likely person to become a superstar. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's program is one of the most astounding I've ever attempted. Believe it or not. One evening in the winter of 1918, the sports cartoonist at the New York Globe hit a creative wall. 
His editors were waiting for him to turn in a sketch for the next day's paper. But 28-year-old Robert Ripley was out of ideas. December of 1918, typically a slow time for a sports cartoonist like Ripley. There weren't a whole lot of games going on. So he often had to scramble during the winter periods to come up with something for the newspaper, to come up with a cartoon. Desperate for inspiration, he pulled out a scrapbook of clippings he had been saving of peculiar athletic feats. He collected articles and notes to himself and all these ideas in order to use those during the winter lull. So he starts sifting through to find a few odd sports feats to cobble together into this one cartoon. Ripley assembled a collage of material and called it Champs and Chumps. It is a series of 11 little drawings. No big central drawing, they're all minor items. It looks like he just scribbled it together. It's kind of a last minute haphazard, okay, I gotta turn in something. Years later, he would say that this was his first Believe It or Not cartoon. But that night, Ripley was simply relieved to make his deadline. He didn't do another one for 10 months. And when he finally did another one, at least he did make some progress. He called it Believe It or Not. But from then on, he might produce a Believe It or Not every few months. He did not recognize it as his ticket to fame by any means. In the early 1920s, Ripley's quirky, sports-themed Believe It or Nots appeared only sporadically, filling in the gaps between his more conventional sports coverage. He wrote articles to accompany his cartoons and quickly garnered a reputation as a good read. If you really appreciate art and literature combined, touted the paper, you can't afford to miss Ripley. About 10 years into Ripley's career at the Globe, Something happens that's a turning point for him in his life and his career. He's sent on this adventure around the world. The ocean liner Laconia was embarking on a luxury cruise that would circle the Earth. Ripley's editors booked the cartoonist's passage on the ship and instructed him to sketch and write about what he saw during the four-month voyage. He had always wanted to travel but he was stuck on a reporter's salary and didn't have really the means to do much traveling until this opportunity fell on his lap to finally see the world. Through his Ramble Round the World columns, Ripley took readers along for the ride of a lifetime. He goes to Hawaii first and then heads over to Asia. He's sending a dispatch home, a, a brief essay and some cartoons every day it was almost like the blogging of its time. It's his first trip to China, first trip to Japan, all life-changing experiences. Introduction to architecture, introduction to religions. It's just all new and exciting to him. But when he gets to India, he's absolutely overwhelmed by Hinduism. It's just as foreign as anything could possibly be to him. On the banks of the Ganges, he witnesses the uh, burning ghats, where people burn corpses. Right alongside these burning corpses are holy men bathing themselves in the water. Elsewhere in town are other holy men who are doing, to Ripley's mind, strange things to themselves to prove their devotion to their God. Staring at the sun until they go blind, holding their arms aloft for 20 years till their arms become fused in place. So suddenly he's seeing some of the most bizarre forms of human behavior that he's ever witnessed, and he's just fascinated by it. And he draws pictures of it. Ripley was transfixed by both the human and man-made extremes he saw. 
Awed by the Taj Mahal, he called it an unsurpassed monument of beauty and human devotion. He returned from India a changed man, which soon became evident in his work. More of his cartoons now begin featuring flashbacks to some of the things that he saw on that trip. They also begin to feature strange things that he is seeing or hearing about elsewhere. It was this progression from the extreme athletes that he once featured in his sports cartoons. They evolved into featuring the extremes in all areas. The eclectic feature drew the attention of crossword publishers Dick Simon and Max Schuster, who wrote the cartoonist offering to publish a book of his cartoons. Ripley threw the letter away. He didn't feel he was a book man. He had been published in newspapers for all his life, and he saw himself as a newspaper cartoonist. May 1927, Lindbergh and the Spirit of St. Louis. Then, one controversial cartoon would launch him onto the national stage. Charles A. Lindbergh before the epic flight to make history. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh is the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. 3,600 miles to Paris, and all America vicariously shares every lonely mile. It is big news. Worldwide, everybody knows the Lindbergh story. He's a national hero. There's a ticket tape parade on Broadway. Ripley put on a cartoon that Lindbergh was not the first man to fly the Atlantic. And it created a sensation. He got thousands of letters. What do you mean by saying such a stupid thing like that? Ripley was accused of being anti-American. He let the furor and publicity around the Lindbergh cartoon build before offering proof. He showed there were a couple of aviators who flew it and two dirigibles that flew over with 30 some odd people in each flight. And so as far as he was concerned, Lindbergh was the 67th man to fly the Atlantic. But the key word is solo. He was the first man to fly solo. He really took a concept and turned it on its head and turned it around and turned it inside out until he could give you a believe it or not fact that just blew your socks off. More shockers soon followed, and his reputation as a brash instigator grew. Meanwhile, Simon and Schuster continued to pursue the artist, and Ripley finally agreed to a book deal. The result was an instant bestseller. You can't imagine a success as stupendous as this. Every book review was just crazy for the book. They were flying off the shelves. The book is really the best of the weirdest, most unusual things that he has found in the last five, six years. That book was the point at which he and the rest of the country finally realized what Ripley was on to. People wanted to be entertained in this way. They wanted their sense of reality to be challenged. Everybody was thrilled with it, and Bob Schuster did something very smart. He sent a copy of the book to William Randolph Hearst, who owned the biggest do syndicate in the world called King Features. And Hearst looked at the book, liked it, and said, hire Ripley. Hearst's newspaper empire stretched from coast to coast. The media mogul offered Ripley a contract worth $100,000 a year, increasing his income tenfold. Ripley signed, committing to pen a new cartoon every day, seven days a week. The phrase, believe it or not, soon entered the national vocabulary as Americans embraced a steady diet of the weird and wonderful. The universe of Believe It or Not contains something for everyone. He had different categories of the odd, the curiosities. There were natural oddities. 
There are people that would bounce down stairs on their heads. And then the, he loved numbers, strange combinations of numbers. He basically said there's an infinity of strangeness in the world that it, never run out. It's inexhaustible, all the weirdness in the world. And he, I think he felt he was barely scratching the surface of it. When Hearst promoted the cartoon with a series of contests, inviting people to submit their own Believe It or Not stories, Ripley was inundated with letters. He's receiving up to 3,000 letters a day. Many of them don't even have his name on the outside. People are drawing puzzles, semaphore, anything to catch Ripley's eye. It becomes such an issue that the postmaster general has to write an edict and say, my guys are not going to waste any more time delivering mail to Robert Ripley. Contest prizes included cars, trips, even airplanes. But for most, the real prize was the chance to be immortalized by the famous cartoonist. Being in the Ripley cartoon would possibly be the most important thing that ever happened to somebody. You know, this is their 15 minutes of fame. Ripley was never cynical or sarcastic. When he presented people doing odd things, it wasn't in a mocking tone, it was in an appreciative tone. I feel like Ripley's life work was ultimately a celebration of the underdog. And I think he viewed himself as an underdog. So I don't think the Ripley Believe It or Not brand that he created was, was just a brand. I think it was a, a complete reflection of who Ripley was. He was born Leroy Robert Ripley in 1890 in Santa Rosa, California, a dusty frontier town north of San Francisco. He was quite odd looking. He had a very severe set of buck teeth. He stammered, he stuttered. Ripley in his youth is shy a bit of an outcast with a stutter and, and funny teeth that, you know, he's not a handsome looking guy. Roy, as he was known, was the eldest of three children. His father worked as a carpenter and the family struggled to make ends meet. When he was growing up, his mother would sometimes make him clothes using the scraps of some of the laundry and sewing jobs that she took in. So Ripley would go to school wearing pants that looked like a dress which is what it was. And the kids noticed and they picked on him and I think he got teased a lot as a kid. A loner, he occupied himself with his favorite pastime, drawing. He's drawing from a very early age a lot. You know, he's drawing every time he gets a chance to. Since the family didn't have much money for something like art supplies, he used butcher paper with a chopping block as an easel. Anytime he had a free moment, he was doodling. As he grew older, Roy dreamed of turning his hobby into a professional career. Just like a kid who was interested in science might aspire to be an engineer because of Thomas Edison, a kid who had a little bit of ability to draw funny pictures would aspire to be a cartoonist. Those guys were famous, they made a lot of money. I mean, to draw funny pictures for a newspaper? What a great job. At age 17, he mailed a small sketch to a national magazine. To his delight, they published his submission and paid him $8. For Ripley to get a cartoon into Life magazine would have been just the, the most exciting thing that ever happened to him. You can imagine Ripley seeing that $8 check and saying, oh, I've got a career. If I can sell one of these a week, I've got it made. When a family friend secured Ripley a job as a sports cartoonist in nearby San Francisco, he said goodbye to his family and left home to begin a career as a professional artist.
He loved the idea of moving to San Francisco. It seemed so far away to him, even though it was only 50 miles south. Ripley's newspaper debut appeared in the evening edition of The Bulletin on February 22, 1909. It depicted a baseball fan's eager anticipation of opening day. But his initial success was tempered by loneliness. I think when he first got settled in San Francisco, he still felt like a little bit of an outsider. You know, he was brand new at this job of sports cartooning. He didn't have many friends. So during this time, Ripley starts spending a lot of time in Chinatown because he can get a cheap meal there. You know, for five cents, he can eat a, some noodles. But I think he was also drawn there. I think in Chinatown, he felt like less of a loner and developed a connection to these people who were on the outside of things themselves. They weren't part of the mainstream. He felt welcome in Chinatown, but Ripley struggled to find his niche in San Francisco's competitive newspaper world. He was fired from two different papers. Colleagues advised the discouraged artist to try his luck in New York, a bigger newspaper market with more opportunities. With nothing to lose, he scraped together his meager savings and bought a one-way ticket east. The move paid off. Ripley soon found a job as a sports cartoonist for Manhattan's Globe and Commercial Advertiser. It was the beginning of a dramatic transformation, starting with his name. If you want to be a tough sports guy in New York, you can't be Leroy. So he changes from Leroy Robert Ripley to Robert Leroy Ripley. With his $25 a week salary, he invested in a new wardrobe, swapping his scruffy California clothes for smart two-piece suits. This new person emerged from this very shy, winning boy from Santa Rosa to this snappy dresser, snappy if loud, garish dresser. Bought his first suit, sent home a picture to his mom of himself posing in Central Park with rolled up pants and a high waist and, and big lapels. And he was just so proud of that, proud that he could finally buy something nice to wear after not having that ability as a child. He rented a studio apartment at the venerable New York Athletic Club. A natural athlete, he availed himself of the club facilities. Handball became his sport of choice. After all, the popular game of handball as it is played today. From 1922 through 1928, handball is a major part of his life. He's the New York City champion. He becomes the national team's champion. I think that success on the handball court was important to him. It was a place where he could excel at something and feel good about himself because he often felt bad about himself as it related to his strange looks and his buck teeth and his stutter. By 1929, Ripley had recast himself from a chump into a champ, a journey culminating in a best-selling book and his new partnership with William Randolph Hearst. With Hearst's financial backing, Ripley packed his bags and set off in search of bigger and better, believe it or not. During the Depression, it was exorbitant to travel by plane or ship. Most people couldn't afford it. Robert Ripley was bringing back the world. He was the messenger. Ripley is credited for going to 201 countries. At the time, there's about 235 recognized countries, so he was the most traveled man of his time. Ripley's fact-finding expeditions took him from Afghanistan to Zanzibar, Fiji to Finland, Mombasa to Marrakesh, he bagged countries like a big game hunter, bringing back one-of-a-kind wonders to readers at home. He 
he was your travel agent. He took you around the world by looking at his cartoons. And he gave you something that you could talk about at the dinner table, which was great because it made you an entertainer. I think the appeal to the Believe It or Not cartoon is curiosity mixed with education. Here's a guy that's traveling to places where I'm never going to get to. I can only dream of. At least I can learn about it through him. And yet, for all his worldly travels, he could also be small-minded and parochial. Normally, you think of somebody like Ripley, who is bringing us the world. You think of them as being something of a highbrow, you know, somebody who's educated and well-traveled. But he was well-traveled kind of like in the way that maybe your weird uncle was well-traveled. One minute, he would really be somebody who was using travel to raise his consciousness. The next minute, he would seem to be just another ugly American tourist. He refused to learn even a few phrases of the local language. He boasted that he would go to places and just speak English louder if people couldn't understand him. Preferring to travel in comfort, Ripley was game to rough it when he had to. He had a fear of flying, yet still managed to log over 600,000 miles, enough to circle the Earth 24 times. But the intrepid globetrotter had a secret, one that he kept hidden a world away. People always thought that there was a team of employees combing the globe looking for all these amazing and strange facts. But the truth was, it was just my grandfather sitting in the library six days a week, 10 hours a day, finding these items and on the bookshelves. Ripley's travels were guided by an unseen hand, a polyglot researcher named Norbert Perlroth, who was directing his employer's adventures from an unlikely location, the New York Public Library. Through Mr. Perlroth, he had the whole world at his fingertips because he could go into any country, and there was Perlroth's research of eight or 10 or 50, believe it or not, that he would go to and discover. I call them the odd couple. There was Robert Ripley and his chief researcher, chief fact checker, Norbert Pearl Roth, who no one's heard of. Ripley had first hired Pearl Roth, a Jewish immigrant from Europe, in the 1920s to help translate documents and research content for his early Believe It or Not feature. Well, my grandfather, Norbert, was a teller at a bank, and uh, Ripley was a client of the bank. My grandfather never sent him a resume or applied for a job. It was just a man in a bank who spoke all these languages and got hired. I think Norbert spoke 14 languages, ultimately, and read them and wrote them. I mean, it was a fantastic find for Ripley. In the quest for material, Perlroth ensconced himself in the reading room of the public library and scoured the stacks and shelves for Believe It or Not facts. My grandfather had a routine that was the routine of all routines. He took the train from Flatbush, Brooklyn, right to 6th Avenue and 42nd Street. He spent the entire day at the library. Then he took the subway back home, had dinner, and I assume he went to bed, and then he did it the next day. While Robert Ripley was hunting after the strange, the fantastic, the weird all over the world, Norbert was hunting through books. Norbert Perlroth was like one of Robert Ripley's own, believe it or not, characters. In fact, it was Perlroth who conceived of the infamous Lindbergh cartoon, one of many born of this fruitful collaboration. Ripley was careful, however, to keep Perlroth's existence quiet. At the end of the day, it was Ripley's, believe it or not. 